Hey everyone, it's Dan and it's time for another Python Tricks video. So today I want to talk about how you can control how a Python class is represented as a string and also um, when you interact with it or inspect it in a Python interpreter session. So let's start with um, a really simple example here. So I've got my popular car class and we're just going to create a simple car object here. And what you can see is that when I print this car object, um, we kind of get this unsatisfying result. And it's the same when I just inspect the object in this interpreter session. So you can see here, well, at least it gives us the class name, kind of the whole namespace of this thing. But um, it you know, only gives us the memory address. If we're on, on CPython, you know, just gives us this ID and it's it's kind of opaque and, and kind of hard to understand what's going on. So this is better than nothing, but it's not super useful. And now there's a common workaround that I see um, some people apply. For example, they start printing out the class attributes uh, directly. And sure, that works. You know, you can do that so we can kind of pry that class apart and kind of reach in and then take out the the color and the um, the mileage here that works and then what I see some people do is they would uh, kind of go ahead and do their own um, two string method right and then that would return or maybe re like print directly or return return a string representing the class but um, actually there is a convention inside Python that um, that handles all of that. So you don't have to roll your own, you don't have to come up with your own ways to do that because there's actually pre-existing uh, conventions on how to do that. So I wanna explain to you how that works. And basically what you're gonna learn today is how the dunder stir and dunder wrapper methods work in Python. This is gonna be a highly useful thing. This is um, a common interview question. So, you know, watching this tutorial you could literally pay you money in the future. So, you know, stay tuned if you don't know how this stuff works. Okay, so to kind of ease into this with a simple example, I took the same car class and I added a dunder stir method here. So the dunder methods are methods that start with a double underscore, just kind of been shortened to dunder. Some people refer to them as magic methods. Um, a lot of people don't like that because they're not really supposed to be magical in any way they're just supposed to be well a python convention and um the kind of the d dunder or the double underscore marks them as um a core python thing so kind of classes are not supposed to actually define their own dunder methods because they can could conflict with uh, python features in the future and so this is just a way i guess to kind of um namespace these things a little bit or you know, just by a naming convention, kind of keeping them separate a little bit, just like the dunder init method. But, you know, total sidetrack here. So what I've done here is I added a dunder stir method. And basically what I did here, whenever that method is called, it just returns the color of the car and kind of tells us it's a car. So, you know, just to show you an example here, again, I'm gonna create um, the same car. And now when I print this car, I actually get a completely different result, right? So this time I get a red car, which is uh, the result of this dunder stir method, instead of this crazy string with the object address and memory. Um, however, when I just inspect this object, I still get the memory address and the previous result, right? So inspecting the, the car object still gives the same result, but when I printed the car object, I got this different result based on the stir method. The, the way you would actually convert an object to string, if you if you wanted to um, force that or make that happen, um, you would just use the built-in stir method. And then that is internally going to do the right thing and call the dunder stir method. And it's gonna give you back the right result. And now all of these uh, functions that deal with um, text representations for objects like the print function, they are going to do that internally, right? They're gonna do the, uh, they're gonna call the stir function for you. And it would be the same with a format string, for example. So if you do this, then this would also call stir and just give you the result. But kind of the key thing is here that 
by convention, if you add a stir method, then it's gonna do a lot of good for you in controlling how your object is represented um, with, or represented as a string. So it's the Pythonic way to do this, which is kind of the holy grail, right? Um, now, still, what you're seeing here was that when I inspected the my car object in the console, I still got the same result. So there seems to be different ways to convert your objects into strings. And now the first one we just learned about, it's called Dunder Stir. And now the second one is called Dunder Repper. And let's talk about what Dunder Repper does and how it's different to Dunder Stir. In order to understand what's going on here, I defined this class or kind of redefined my car class. And um, what this new version of the car class does, it actually has a wrapper and a stir implementation. And now those implementations are just dummy implementations that are gonna tell us what's going on behind the scenes. So if something calls wrapper behind the scenes, we're gonna get wrapper, uh, wrapper for car as a result. And if something calls stir, we're gonna get stir for car as a result, right? So now we can kind of walk through the, the same example again and do a print my car. You can see here, okay, it called the stir function. Uh, we could also go through the format example again. You can see it called the stir function. And now if we do my car and just inspect that, we can see here that it's actually called wrapper for the car. And another way to, to force this is um, to call the built-in wrapper function. And then that's gonna do the right thing and call the, um, the correct Dunder wrapper implementation for this. Usually you just wanna use the stir and Repper helpers for that. Now, of course, the big question is, okay, so now we have these two, what's what's actually the difference between them or what's the different use cases where uh, where you would use them? All right, so we have stir and we have repper and they're both called by some convention, but you know, what's, what's actually the difference? Like what shouldn't they return the same thing or how are we gonna deal with this? And uh, the answer that I've got for you is Let's look at what some of the Python built-in classes or some of the, the classes from the Python standard library are doing here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna import the, uh, the date time module, and then we're just gonna create a new date object, right? So I just created a new date time dot date object, and then we're gonna try and experiment with that so we can see how it reacts, right? How how does its stir and wrapper function react and what result do we get from it? So let's call stir on that date object. And you can see here, we get a pretty concise representation. Um, it's quite readable, looks like an ISO date format, um, which is kind of a standard representation for a, a date in string form. And, um, Okay, <laughs> and now we call wrapper on the same object instance. Uh, it actually looks quite different because uh, now we get a more elaborate result that um, is really unambiguous, right? So this is not any kind of date, but we know exactly it's a date time dot date object and it was created in this way. And we could even copy and paste this and uh, or execute that as, as valid Python and would recreate the same object, right? Like I said earlier, when you call, like when you just inspect an object in the interpreter, that also gives you the wrapper. This gives us a pretty good idea of the difference between stir and wrapper. So when you actually go to the Python documentation, do some reading on the best practices that people have come up with in the community, then you'll learn that the the dunder stir method, it's uh, mainly used for giving an easy to read representation of your class, right? So stir should be easy to read and it's meant for human consumption, right? So you can see that here, it's this ISO date. You could just, you know, you could display that to a user and it wouldn't be too bad. Now with uh, wrapper, on the other hand, um, it should be unambiguous, right? So did I type that correctly? Yeah. So with wrapper, on the other hand, it should be unambiguous. So the goal here really is to be as explicit as possible about what this object is. And it's, I guess, more meant for 
internal um, internal use and something that would make things easier to debug for a developer, but you wouldn't necessarily want to display that to a user, right? And so some people actually recommend that the result of your wrapper should be um, something like this, that, that would actually be valid Python and that you could just run again and it would recreate the same object. Now, I find that Personally, I find that this is a really good idea, but it's usually really hard to attain that in practice. So um, I think the the bottom line is that you want your wrapper to be unambiguous and more meant for developers, but the stir, you want that to be easy to read and potentially for human consumption. So now another interesting, or there are a couple more interesting things that I want to talk about here because they really, um, you know, they, they really make this whole thing a little bit easier to understand how it works in the real world. So the next example I want to show you is an actual implementation that someone might take for, uh, for their class. And, and because Python falls back to calling wrapper, if you don't define a uh, separate stir implementation, my recommendation is actually to put a dunder wrapper on any class that you define, um, because then you get a pretty helpful and readable result in all cases. And now what I'm going to do is also give you a complete example of how you would do that because there, there's um, uh, a slight trick you can apply to make this a little bit easier to work with. So again, we've, I've got my car class here and uh, I'm defining the wrapper right now. And so how I would go about doing this is, um, well, returning a string that, you know, contains the car class name and then, um, I probably do this color and self, right? And then that's a format string. And then I would just pass the self object. Now, the, a common thing that I see here is that usually you have to retype the name of the class inside the wrapper. But there's actually a way to get around that because we can just reach into the class itself and ask it for its name. So what you can do here instead is you can use self, uh, self dot class dot or dot dunder class dot dunder name. This is getting kind of long, so you want to make sure you format that in a way that's sensible. But basically what this is going to do, it's going to automatically um, use the right name for the class. So you don't have to make sure you update this, right? So you might not want that in some cases, maybe you want the, the wrapper uh, class name to be static, but usually this is, this is like a good default implementation for your wrappers. And now when I create a new my car object and I inspect it, I get a really nice result. Um, and also when I call stir on it, or when I print the car, I get the same result because the default implementation for stir just calls wrapper internally. Okay, so this is kind of the minimum implementation I would recommend to you um, where you're adding a wrapper to any class that you define, kind of leave the, the stir on the side and you would use something like this so you don't have to type the class name again. Okay, so before we wrap this up, there's one more thing I wanted to mention, and that is how containers convert their child objects or the objects they contain to string. And um, the maybe the surprising thing is that even if you call stir on a container, so I'm creating this list object here, even if you call stir on a container, it's going to represent the internal objects with the wrapper function. So when I you know, I'm using the today object, which is just a datetime object uh, or datetime dot date object. So when I have this list here of these three date objects and then I call stir on it, I actually get a string back that has the container and with the wrapper inside. So this is just some something to keep in mind um, how that works. Uh, so if you wanted to kind of convert those with the stir function individually, you would just need a loop or some, some kind of list comprehension to do that manually. But you know, that's just a side note. I think really the bottom line or the one takeaway from this thing here is at least add a thunder wrapper to your classes. All right, so I hope you learned something new today and um, you're gonna be able to apply that in a real world program or in some code that you write. Cool, well, happy Pythoning and I'll talk to you soon. 